wow, okay. I'm nervous, like I just flashed back to my own graduation. I feel nervous, like I'm graduating and what's expected of me and I'm wearing these robes and, okay. So first, that was supposed to all be in my head. Um, I wanna thank Dean Matthews. I wanna thank everybody at the Rubenstein School and at the University of Vermont for inviting me because I've actually been really nervous. I speak a lot around the country, but I've never been asked to do a commencement speech and I felt like it, it's like really important because I get to like say these words and hopefully they'll mean something to all of you. So I'm really privileged to be here today. So thank you for allowing me to take a little bit of your time. Hopefully you like what I got to say. All right, so I wrote it down because I have a tendency to go all over the place, but I really wanted to respect everyone's time. I kind of call this signs of the time, righteous road. I love the possibility of you. I love the possibility of you. 100 years ago today, only 19% of 15 to 18 year olds attended secondary school and only 9% graduated. You weren't even a dream. I love the possibility of you. 100 years ago, only one in 10 adults could read or write. Did they see you coming? 100 years ago, we ate less meat, not because we were vegetarians or particularly concerned about animals, but there was a voluntary food rationing because we cared for the soldiers who fought in the Great War. Many died anyway. I love the possibility of you. 100 years ago, the flu pandemic of 1918 killed 50 million people worldwide. Who knew that you could be here today? I love the possibility of you. 100 years ago, Irvin Berlin wrote, God bless America. And in response, Woody Guthrie wrote, this land is your land to expose the lopsided distribution of wealth, land, and possibility in this country. Who knew that you could stand here today? 100 years ago, women could not vote. The vision of who we could be was limited to the dreams and privileges of a few. Your presence was not anticipated, or maybe it was. Who knew what you might bring? 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was 47 years old. You might nearly be done before you've barely begun, and I might not be here to witness your possibility. Yes, I just told a little truth about my age. <laughs> what are the odds we would be here today together? I spent some time looking online to find out what was happening 100 years ago in the United States. Who did we imagine ourselves to be? While I found facts and stories and moments of glory, Charlie Chaplin was the most popular film star, Babe Ruth was with the Red Sox, Woodrow Wilson was president, and people drove Model Ts, I had to dig a little harder to find some deeper truth of who we've been, and so I dug. 101 years ago today, in 1917, white people shot, lynched, and stabbed anyone with black skin in East St. Louis for 24 hours. Many died. Who knew I could be here today? Nearly 100 years ago, the Immigration Act of 1924 excluded all immigrants from Asia. Japanese, Chinese, Korean, South Asian, you were persona non grata. Not only were you not imagined, no one wanted you here. In the 1920s, gay men and women were arrested and convicted under state sodomy laws for simply being themselves. 100 years ago, the life expectancy for a Native American man was 48. For a Native woman, it was 51. As the original inhabitants of this place we call home, they have seen everything since the beginning. They have seen the land on which they belong subsumed by greed and fear and someone else's possibility that did not include them. They have seen their own blood spilled over and over again in your name and mine. This country was not founded on love. Just ask the descendants of tribes who lost the right to live in the land that they were born from. This country was not founded on love. 
Just ask the descendants of African women and men whose backs are broken and bleeding so that we might live the American dream. This country was not founded on love. Just ask the Chinese who built all railways but were disappeared from the photos that memorialized the moment of completion and new possibility. This country was not founded on love. Just ask the Japanese farmer whose right to grow free was interned by our fears. This country was not founded on love. Just ask the new Mexican who can no longer practice old ways on the land that they thought was their home. This country was not founded on love. I repeat this because if history tells us anything, if justice is love made public, as Cornel West says, then there should be no surprise that we have not loved ourselves as we should. And just because we put the word environment in front of justice does not change the history, the practices, or the outcomes. We're not going to see more righteous policies for the environment and this land if we're not doing that for each other. This country was not founded on love, but I believe this country was founded on possibility. There is a quote by Thomas Jefferson where he says that, deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites, 10,000 recollections by the blacks of the injuries they have sustained will produce convulsions, which will probably never end, but in the extermination of the one or the other race. Thomas Jefferson was a complicated dude. He was president, he owned slaves. He helped write the Constitution, he owned slaves. He was president, he raped a black woman and had children with her. He had the privilege of owning people as property to do with what he wanted, and he had the foresight to know that we would all be reliving this tension for a long time. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. James Baldwin. So in 1996, I lived in Seattle, Washington. It was summer and I was working a temp job. I was saving because I was about to move to Logan, Utah, yeah, where I was diversity, but that's a whole nother story, to get a master's degree at Utah State University. I was walking to a bus stop in downtown Seattle along with a lot of other people. A number of, number of us were walking down a road, right? Either there, there was no cars on the road, we could just walk on the road. And I wasn't looking because I was looking straight ahead, so I wasn't looking down. And I didn't notice there was a big pothole there. And I stepped into the pothole. And I heard my ankle crack. And so any of you who've ever fractured a bone, it's weird, you kind of hear it before you feel it. Um, I felt a wave of nausea threaten to overtake me. Um, and I thought I was going to pass out and I got very scared. And people kept walking by, kept walking by, kept walking by. So I walked over to the sidewalk, and this was the pre-cell phone days, y'all. I know you don't know what I'm talking about, but there used to be a time. So I was looking for a payphone to call my then boyfriend. But I called him, but I was bent over, and I was trying to sit down on the sidewalk, and I looked up next to me, and it looked like it was a young family. It was a young white family, a man, a woman, two small kids. And I said, can you help me? And I was crying, because I said, man, if I go unconscious here, who's going to help me? And they just shook their heads, moved away from me, and ignored me. I started to cry. I know some of you are angry. You know, I'm angry too. I'm mad about a lot of things. I'm mad about the new Green Book. The original Green Book was called the Negro Motorist Green Book and was created in 1936 by Victor Hugo Green, who felt the need to design a guide detailing information for what I like to call traveling while black hotels, restaurants that you could stay safely in during Jim Crow. Well, I'm mad because now folks are talking about the new version reflected in hashtags, stories of non-white travelers being rejected by Airbnb hosts or booted off wine tours in Napa Valley. I'm mad about the Me Too movement, the necessity to have a movement that in part asks for those, of those who have been victimized to relive their trauma in order for the rest of us to believe that this is a problem worthy of resistance. 
I'm mad about what has happened to black people at the hands of the police. I'm mad about Charlottesville. I'm mad about Standing Rock. I'm mad about school shootings and border walls and neo-Nazis. I'm mad that words like diversity and climate change have been plucked from websites and common conversations uh, between this administration and the rest of the country. I'm mad about what happened in Oakland recently. Did you see that a few days ago? A white woman called the police because two people were barbecuing, black people were barbecuing, I guess using the wrong grill. I'm mad. Uh, about 10 days ago, I was on my way to Eugene, Oregon, and I was in an airport, and there was an Indian woman, a South Asian woman, standing in front of me in line. And she started talking about all the work she does. She said she's been to 75 countries. She said she goes around talking to businesses about the importance of being able to work with different people. And she talks to companies about how to do this. And she was kind of really petite, but like she scared me, man, because she was so clear-eyed and resolute. And she looked at me and she said, sympathy and empathy are not enough. Who do you stand with? So who are we willing to stand with? What becomes possible when we stand with each other? So I decided to take another look at the last 100 years. We sent a man to the moon. We invented the computer. We transplanted our first organ in 1954. We created the artificial heart. The New York Mets won the World Series in 1969. I'm from New York, so I love that. The Chicago Cubs won the World Series in 2016. We bore Frank Lord Wright, Romari Burden, and Georgia O'Keeffe, and Jean-Paul Basquiat, and Zora Neale Hurston, and Wilma Mankiller, and Carl Sagan, and Garden Gordon Parks, and Norman Rockwell, and Cesar Chavez, and Andy Warhol, and Bruce Lee, and Elvis, and Prince, and Michael Jackson, and Maya Angelou. We created Black Panther, Wakanda. We passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. We passed the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969. We passed the Clean Water Act in 1972. We passed the Endangered Species Act in 1973. We supported the Civil Liberties Act in 1988, a piece of legislation that offered a formal apology to the more than 100,000 people of Japanese descent who were incarcerated in Japanese internment camps. We passed the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. We elected our first African-American president in 2008. In 1967, we ruled that interracial marriage was fully legal everywhere in this country. Black, brown, and white women and men could say I do to each other. In 2015, we ruled that the Constitution allows for same-sex couples to marry. Men and women could say I do to whomever they want. We declared Black Lives Matter, time's up, take a knee. We've stood with Standing Rock, Ferguson, Stoneman Douglas High School with those impacted by Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Harvey. We've protested, created, and loved. We've stood with people, animals, trees, water, and land. We have always stood for the possibility of something better, and we have always shown that we can stand with each other. There's this place in Michigan called Idlewild, about 300 miles from Chicago that was known as the Black Eden from 1912 to about the 1960s. This is where black people could buy property and go there for vacation during segregation. It was 3,500 years of forest and possibility. So you had people like W.E.B. Du Bois, Madam C.J. Walker who bought property, artists like Josephine Baker, Louis Armstrong, and Stevie Wonder would perform there. You could swim, you could ride horses, you could sit under a, the shade of a tree and drink lemonade if that's what you wanted. You could do it freely and freely enjoy all the things that non-human nature so generously provides. But that's not the main thing I want to tell you. When the first inhabitants of Idlewild came to Michigan, they had to put up street signs. So the street signs either said where they came from, so it might say one street might be called Louisville, or the street sign said what they aspired to, harmony, joy, peace, serenity, and my favorite, righteous road. Despite the challenges of their time, their ability to find and create joy, love, and possibility was never diminished. The signs of the time were their dreams of tomorrow. All things were possible. At every moment, you can make a different choice. And it's not about being easy, and it's not about being comfortable. It's about being better. That's why I love the possibility of you. Because you're everything I can't imagine, and, and everything I can't dream, and that is worth fighting for. 
So this is the end, and this is when people usually say something to all the young folks who are about to go out and show out in the world, and they often say things like, reach for the stars. But I want to say, reach for each other, because together all things are possible, and you got this. Thank you.